Um, so Drew, thank you for um, giving us an insight into that really interesting research um, and I really look forward to hearing more about what comes after this actually. Um, I'd like to start us off by picking up on the second objective of the research, um, which was to assist policy makers to understand and facilitate the readiness of industry and to highlight future research opportunities in the face of technology disruption. So how do you see these two areas of policy and research lining up? That's a, that's a, it's a great uh, starting point for, uh, for discussing the report because if this report only identified policy recommendations, I, I think it would be of less than half the value. Mm. Uh, the, the point very deliberately is to say that policy and research go hand in hand. Now, the context for that is that we're talking about a sector in disruption and about the only thing you can be sure about in a disrupted sector is that whatever you think today, a good part of it will be wrong at some stage in the not too distant future. So I, you know, the, the, the two sectors that I'm more familiar with, energy and communications, are also going through a great deal of disruption. They also happen to have fundamental enabling technologies for communications. And I see in those sectors that policy is a dynamic process. It's not a set and forget exercise. Governments make policy based on best available analysis and evidence today. Disruption occurs. Sometimes the policy uh, will still be relevant and that the forecasts are right. Sometimes it'll be wrong. It's research that underpins that whole concept of dynamic, continuously improving and updating the policy settings. And it's research that will drive, uh, that essentially is the driver of policy. So I think a strength of the Academy's work is to look at those two sides, those two dimensions yeah. side by side. Yeah, great. Um, Cecilia, Ian, anything you'd like to add to that? I might just add um, industry and, you know, sort of represent the insurance industry, but, but industry more broadly that is interested in changing technology. And I think um, the work that, that the Academy has done has produced a, a piece that can actually be um, useful in, in many senses beyond research and or policy. And I, I completely agree that the two need to go hand in hand. And I think what industry can bring and learn from as well is really critical. You need something that you can... Um, that can give you some sense of certainty or something that can at least be a guiding post in the midst of a lot of noise around what disruption means, particularly headline grabbing noise. So I think what the work done has done is to really ground the thinking around um, readiness, around research questions, all of which needs to be done as, in a collaborative way between government, research and industry. And I'll, I'll just add to that. So. The interesting thing about transport is that it's very much the province of uh, state jurisdictions. It's state governments that are responsible for the movement of people and it's actually state governments largely that are responsible for the freight. So the challenge is, and, and you mentioned in your presentation Drew that it was COAG and it's all state government, all governments, so federal and state, uh, uh, you know, need to engage with this challenge and this opportunity that we face and because it's not just a question of getting Canberra to do the right thing, it's actually getting all the states to em embrace the opportunity to, and to invest themselves in enough research to make then informed policy for, uh, to enable their jurisdiction to extract early benefits from the technology. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd now like to pick up on the, the readiness of Australia, noting that point that we are taking Australia as a whole. Um, KPMG recently published a, a global um, automated vehicle readiness index and Australia as a whole ranked 15 out of 25 countries. Um, top of that leaderboard were the Netherlands and Singapore. So we often hear about the disadvantages of Australia's geography um, as being an impediment to our economic success. Um, so I'll start with Drew again. Um, do you think there's a way that we can turn this to our advantage, um, both in the broader technology sense, picking up on the work here, um, and then pass to the panel to think about that more from a, a transport perspective as well? 
Yeah, so you know, what, what, do, what does Australia have that Singapore and the Netherlands don't, or what do they have that we don't? And, and of course, the economic geography of those three uh, countries is so dramatically different, and Singapore and the Netherlands are more alike, uh, obviously, in that respect. So this, this issue about you know, the, the tyranny of distance, that we're uh, a continent, with a small number of medium-large cities on a global scale and a lot of space in between. Um, it, it's not a question, I think, as, as you're leading towards of woe is us and we can't make this work or, or whatever. It's a, how do we adapt to uh, and adopt, develop in a way that makes sense for Australia. I think one of, so, so the, the long distance heavy freight task is something specific to Australia. Moving freight between Melbourne and Brisbane, east coast and west coast is a big deal. Yep. Uh, and uh, the role of some of the technologies that we've talked about in this study, I, I think can be quite profound in that area. I look at the, the relationship between the transport sector and the energy sector. So a lot of the focus is on electrification, um, electric vehicles, obviously, uh, but equally, well, not equally yet, but coming up behind it is the interest in hydrogen and the role that hydrogen as a, as a fuel carrier can play in the, in the transport sector is particularly interesting for that heavy and long task. And of course, Australia has comparative advantage in the manufacturing of hydrogen through our abundant renewable energy uh, resources and indeed abundant natural gas. So, so I think there are areas uh, around hydrogen is one example where, where the tyranny of distance can, can turn out to be a driver of advantage. Yep. So find those things that we can really focus in on and turn them to our advantage. Ian, you look keen to respond to that. Uh, well, I, I agree, but I would say nothing like uh, the motivation to compete, be econo economically competitive in the, on the world stage to drive us towards early adoption of new technologies. I mean, if we're shipping mangoes out of Bowen in Queensland or wheat out of Perth, Fremantle, I mean, it, at, the, at the destination, they don't care about how many kilometres it took to get, the, get the, the product there. There's a price and we have to be competitive in the final market. So it's absolutely incumbent on us to, uh, to invest and to achieve that, that competitive performance of the transport network. Uh, you know, and, and you know, we see it already happening. You know, Australia is, would be one of, if not the world's uh, leading user of high productivity vehicles. We, 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 we run two, three, four trailer uh, road trains as it's a, it's a unique Australian response to this challenge of distance. So we're already kind of well down that track. I think we should keep going and embrace the emerging technologies as well. Yeah. Cecilia, your, your remit is, is a bit broader than just mobility as well. Any thoughts on our readiness? Look, I think um, we do have some unique challenges. Kangaroos are often brought up as one of the particular <laughs> challenges for connected and automated vehicles as, um, as they are quite erratic and not that easy for the systems to determine what they will do. Um, so we do have some uniqueness. I think the thing that I'm probably um, quite interested in at the moment is um, the opportunity and the capability that our, that our research sector has. So we have researchers in Australia in this space who are connected globally and who are doing some really interesting work and some of it is world leading. And I think the opportunity we have to really support and connect and engage with that <coughs> capability and to, to see what, what could we do we may not manufacture the vehicles, but we may provide some sort of safety assurance or certification around some of the systems or algorithms, etc. There's lots that we can actually do in this space. I see it sort of more open than, than closed for us. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll go to Ian for the next question. Um, so the report highlights five key recommendations to address our readiness to um, develop, adopt and adapt to the pending changes by 2030. Um, can you give some sort of comments on what do you think is being done uh, today or can be done in the immediate time frame to improve our readiness to embrace technology and digitization? So what, what, what are we doing today? Yeah. 
So you, you'll, you'll note in the report and its recommendations that some, some of the aspirations require some fairly substantial investment and, and, and have uh, a, a fairly long time frame. So we, on the other hand, kind of look at, okay, so what can we do today? And we think that the, the earliest opportunities uh, are come from actually better information sharing, data sharing, if you will. So at the moment, it, it, uh, most of our uh, freight data is fairly siloed. It's, you know, it's held by this operator or that operator. There's not very much sharing of that basic information about the flow of goods. So how much, how much improvement in, in uh, supply chain effectiveness could we get by just a, a minimum amount of data sharing? You'll notice in, so in some places in Australia that you, know, you can get uh, access to uh, real-time public transport information. So when is, when it, where is the bus and where is it, when is it actually going to arrive? In other places, it's, it's just a timetable uh, and that's the best we can do. So I see for, from a, the, one of the earliest benefits that we can achieve out of this is, is better sharing of the data we've already got. And then second to that is generate more data where we're missing it um, and share that too. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Cecilia, Drew, any thoughts on that? Um, I might just sort of refer to the work that National Transport Commission is doing. We've got Marcus here. Um, I think that the um, enabling sort of regulations and legislation that needs to be in place and, and how we think about sort of liability in, in the future of these things, they're incredibly complex questions. And I know that dialogue has been going on for at least three years, if not longer, um, to try and um, build a set of, uh, or a framework. So I think we are doing um, some interesting things in this space. We are really trying to grapple with the question. No one has an exact certain answer, but um, I think it's the fact of the dialogue and the fact of the willingness to um, open up and have these conversations before the technology is necessarily uh, ready for, for a consumer market um, is, is really interesting. And, and, and the report talks about the consumer readiness being being quite high. So this is probably something we, we can really take advantage of. Okay. Um, Drew, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, I think there's, there's an interesting parallel and relationship on consumer readiness. Uh, the, what's happening in renewable energy in Australia at the moment and the potential for electric vehicles. Right. And I, I see them uh, all quite... A, re a really interesting relationship between them. So if, if you think at the moment Australia has the highest rate of uptake of household photovoltaics of any country in the world, one in five. You know, two million Australian house homes have PVs on the, uh, PV cells on their roof today and it's continuing to grow. And and the next uh, wave, technological wave behind that will be batteries, of household storage batteries. And that's not unrelated um, to the cost curve around batteries and electric vehicles. And so that, that disruption has happened on the back of regulatory interventions, financial incentives, and consumer engagement consumer desire to be mm. part of that of that process and I think there's enormous potential for the same phenomena to occur around electric vehicles so at some stage electric vehicles will reach parity with internal combustion engines and then they'll continue to improve that this seems a trajectory that you can fairly confidently predict today um, you can have some uncertainty about when um, but but that does not seem a heroic uh, forecast. And so one of the research questions that, that is highlighted in the report is, well, if there were to be a, a rapid, deep uptake of electric vehicles by Australian uh, households, fleet operators, industry, etc., what would be the impact on the electricity grid? And, and it's a perfect, and we say in this report that that's certainly an important question that needs further research. Now, if I switch hats and put on my energy sector hat, the answer is we're all over this um, because it is, it is a huge question. 
and it's not just challenge, you know, beware. It's, it's opportunity writ large. Electricity consumption in Australia has, for the last several years, been flat or declining. And that, that is actually a problem. Uh, and, and the demand curve is being hollowed out in the middle of the day by all of those household PVs before you even get to the grid scale solar. So what does the grid look like as hundreds of thousands to millions of battery powered vehicles start zooming around and plugging in? Well, what it looks like to me is opportunity. Um, it looks like the first best chance we've got for growth in demand for electricity. Growth in demand will put downward pressure, it will reduce the unit price because the fixed costs are being spread over a larger user base. So it will reduce the cost of electricity for other purposes. But the key to this is, is that this happens in a managed, coordinated, rational way. That it is not a function of r millions of random connections into the system. Because of course they won't be random. There'll be a dominant connection in the evenings when people arrive home. So you think about charging uh, of electric vehicles. And so three possible or three profiles of charging. Convenience. When I park somewhere, be it home, car park, work, I plug in. Convenience charging. Smart day charging. I will charge in the middle of the day during solar peaks. Uh, or overnight charging. Uh, I'll charge uh, off-peak, much like we're all used to off-peak hot water. Where would that electricity come from? Possibly from the battery in your home. And remember that, that electric vehicle charging is not necessarily going to be the same as refuelling an internal combustion engine car. Most people, I suspect, fill up their tank, run it down to less than a quarter, and then refill it totally. I think electric vehicle charging could have a quite different dynamic of opportunistic top-up charging. So there's huge potential to coordinate and orchestrate that phenomena on the electricity system in a way that is not just neutral, but is actually positive for the electricity grid and for electricity consumers more broadly. Yeah. Um, my colleagues here in Victoria recently did a, a study on electric vehicles and they modelled a, a number of different scenarios about the uptake of electric vehicles. Um, but at its peak, they um, projected that by 2046, if we assume all vehicles are electric vehicles, then there would be an additional 50% increase in total electricity <laughs> consumption, um, which is pretty significant. Um, I was chatting with a friend of mine on the weekend who um, runs a logistics um, business and we talked about how they might make the transition and his challenge um, back to me was obviously the range um, but also that, that opportunistic um, charging of the uh, freight vehicles and we, we played around with different ideas of maybe you give free delivery and you're able to charge wherever you're dropping off. Um, Ian, have you thought um, about the impact of electric vehicles on the, the freight industry? So the freight industry um, you know, uh, comprises a sort of a, a big vehicle part and a small vehicle part um, for the, the, the long haul, if you like, and, the, and the, the last mile delivery bit. And I think there is a, there, there is a lot of interest at the last mile level to go uh, to look at electric, partly for partly for uh, cost, partly for um, convenience, uh, emissions reduction, noise reduction. Uh, so electric vehicles make uh, good last mile delivery opportunities and, and I think there's a lot of uh, interest in that. At the long haul end though, it, it, as you said, the, the, the range problem is quite significant and uh, I don't know of anybody who's seriously looking at, at electric vehicles for long haul um, operations. So in a sense, the transport sector is in, in, in a, bit of a, a bit of a mix. It, it is going to come under pressure for emissions reduction and, uh, going forward over time. It's a part of the Australian economy that uh, has, has sort of uh, sat in the shadows a little bit uh, in, in that regard. Uh, 
but the, the, the mechanism by which we do that um, is, is not yet clear. And you know, it may be that hydrogen is, actually has to be the, uh, the, the, the route of investigation next. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Cecilia, I might ask you the next question. Um, so in the past, I think there's been an assumption that um, government needs to be the driving force behind changes in policy and regulation um, and making sure that we as a nation or states are ready to accept the change and drive the change. Um, as the lead for IAG's research and development function, do, do you now see there's greater collaboration between industry and government and research um, organisations to drive this change? Look, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's a necessity. If you look at um, regulators' challenge, I guess, when Uber came and disrupted the taxi industry, um, there's a sense in which a disruptive change in, in tech that was um, consumers sort of gravitated to um, caught regulators off guard, and I think it caught a, a bunch of people off guard. Um, if, we, if we look at what's happening today, and I mentioned the work of the National Transport Commission, um, there's also the work of other groups such as iMove, ADVI, that is bringing together um, already forming these collaboration spaces where industry researchers and government are all active participants. I'd say that the conversation is, is happening and it's there. I think what we could do is amplify it. So that really comes, yes, it comes from government, but yes, it comes from industry, yes, it comes from researchers, and it's how much we all put in and and focus on that space. So I know, um, you know, it's sort of a plug to iMove, um, that the, the cooperative research concept enables a lot of that. And I think um, the more we can amplify that effort, the more it means that researchers can see their work come to fruition, industry can actually leverage off that, and we can have a proper policy conversation um, as Drew was articulating, there's research questions that still need to feed into policy. So we actually need that to take place because the change is too complex. There's too much uncertainty and it's, it's too networked now. It's not just about one thing. It's not just about transport. It's also about health. It's also about energy. It's also about all these other things. And um, that, I guess, reflects the fact that we're people. But yep. But it's it's a it's a more complex and nuanced world now, I think. Okay. Um, and thinking about it from a, an IAG perspective and an insurance perspective, um, where do you see your industry needing to play a role and a, a bigger role? So I think um, you know insurance is really around um, resilience, so helping communities to recover after there's been some sort of individuals or communities, after there's been some sort of drama or disaster or, or event. Um, so, so there is sort of a, a question around trust and then how we help people to recover. Um, that does go to risk management, goes to things like safety assurance, trying to understand a risk before it will take place. If I was to be really specific, um, and it's one of the things that have been called out in the report, cyber risk is something that will very much attach to connected and automated um, systems, and it's something that we're going to have to be really well across and, and quite cognizant of. Um, and we're doing some research through iMove in this space just to try and help us to understand better what sorts of cyber requirements and data requirements we need to understand before our customers hop into these vehicles. Great, interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to add to that because, so we, we face a, a challenge here. So we've got a, a strong level of community appetite for these emerging technologies, uh, but they come with, with a fair amount of unknown. And, and so we're, we're on this sort of balancing act, but how fast can we push ahead to, to garner the benefits without exposing ourselves to, to risk of calamity? and and. The, so there needs to be actually quite a substantial amount of research into the, what what do the risks of calamity really look like when you when you dig into them and so cyber is indeed one of those that's so there's actually several projects going on in I've moved to uh, develop appropriately appropriate cyber security for connected and automated vehicles so that we can march forward and put them on the roads with confidence that actually the the, the operation of the vehicles and the and the occupants in the vehicles are are safe and protected from um, 
malevolent uh, intervention, shall we say. So, so I use cyber as a specific example of the sort of research that we need and the, and the capabilities, the skills that we need to cultivate. And we need to do that really quite urgently in order to facilitate the introduction of these technologies into, into really the public space, to, to, to the high street, um, because that, that's, where the, we, that's where we get the benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And the interesting thing is that people, um, not surprisingly, associate this new technology with their, their own technological experiences. Mm -hmm. So if their computer has a software fail, or if the phone just doesn't quite work, then that's, that's how they, they actually draw those, those links. So I think your, your point around um, ensuring that the conversation we have with the community around the tech is one where they can trust because there's good research going on, there's really good ways of introducing the technology, we're not just being um, you know, discourteous to people or not thinking about their safety, we're actually thinking through a whole range of things and that is, it, it is, requires government, industry and, and research, it requires that nexus. Drew, any? Um, comments on that? No? Okay. Um, so uh, another question for all of you. Um, so the report talks about um, four possible solutions to the challenges, which were sustainability and climate change, productivity, productivity and health. Um, those possible solutions, just to remind everyone, low and zero emissions vehicles, connected and autonomous vehicles, high frequency mass transit and intelligent transport systems. So in your opinion, um, which of these potential solutions has um, the potential to have the biggest impact and why? Who, who would like well, to go first? I, I'm going to, be, because I see uh, data and data flow and data sharing as, as a fundamental driver actually for several of the, mm -hmm. the above, so uh, mass transit systems, uh, connected and automated vehicles, uh, and, and more generally, most of the productivity improvement that we seek is that the first benefit from that is going to come from from better information availability, information sharing. So, in a way, I'm I'm, I'm going to kind of duck around the side of your question a bit and, and, and point to to data and the way that we go about having the the, the community dialogue. So, so when when uh, when Drew makes a trip on 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 public transport. You know, to what extent is Drew going to be comfortable that other people make use of the knowledge of that trip or the knowledge of the fact that Drew makes that trip every day that in a way respects Drew's privacy and we don't really, we don't really know or care that it's Drew or where he lives, but we do care about the pattern of behaviour that's revealed in the data, just as we care about what freight needs to be moved, when it needs to be moved, where it needs to go, we, we have to get, we have to evolve an understanding of, of the demand at a fairly, at a fairly granular level in order then to uh, leverage up the benefit. But that requires a, a, a kind of a, a more nuanced conversation with the community, with, with freighters, with, with transport operators, so that we can evolve uh, a, a, a shared understanding of what, what constitutes legitimate use of this bit and that bit and the other bit of data. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Cecilia? Well, at the risk of being um, slightly controversial, I want to say all four, um, <laughs> but, but that's taking the easy way out. Um, look, the, the filter for, for me really comes down to the purpose that we have, which is to help make your world a safer place. That's our sort of guiding purpose. So it really does come down as an immediate thing, connectivity. So we talk a lot about connected and automated vehicles. I think connectivity and the way that, um, or uh, cooperative intelligent systems, the way that vehicles can communicate with everything to reduce accidents and really provide an extra set of eyes um, to cars, vulnerable road users, pedestrians, etc., on the road. So really being able to reduce the toll on the road in a faster way. Um, add automated into that and that really um, escalates that. But also the zero and low um, emissions. So if we think about the effect of air pollution on people, we know that um, there's, there's been a report that more than double of what we have in road toll, uh, people are dying from air pollution or, or toxicity in, in cities. So from that perspective, um, also zero and low carbon. Great, thank you. Drew? It, it's, 
it's a it's an interesting question to ask, and and you've you do have to challenge is the is the question, you know, it, it's impossible to answer the question, um, mm -hmm. and yep. perhaps that's the, the <laughs> point of asking it, but but it, but it does open a really important discussion. So the four platforms are all progressing at the moment, right? and and you see lots of policy action and money flowing towards them and research effort. And our, our study was really about saying, where can we go faster yeah. and do more? Yeah. It's not suggesting that, we're, that the field is vacant in any of the areas. Mm. But, but I think Ian's point is a good way into your question of what are the uh, enabling technologies and capabilities behind all four that if we got wrong, could actually set us back. And I think data is, is, is the first and most obvious answer to that. And it's the management of the data is, is something that, that uh, is certainly worthy of a lot more effort and under, and it, because it will underpin all four of those platforms. I think electric vehicle charging in all of its dimensions, technological, regulatory, tariff, infrastructure is also um, an important, a very important piece of the puzzle for two of the platforms, um, the first two LEVs and uh, connected and autonomous. And, and that's also the one that I suspect whatever we think today is likely to turn out to be wrong in 10 or 20 years. Yeah. And that the, the, the models and technologies and arrangements for charging, I think are relatively immature uh, and are almost certainly to be disrupted by things that we can't foresee today. Yeah. I, I, I would completely agree. The, the work we did in New South Wales around the future transport technology strategy, there were five technology enablers, um, five key areas. And for me, the, the one that underpinned everything was the intelligent transport uh, transit systems underpinned by data. And so it's not just having the data, but as Michael and I were talking earlier, it's about doing something with that data and being able to bring together those data sources to your point earlier. Um, it, um, transport organizations have incredibly rich organi uh, organizational data, but it's only when you bring that together and you start asking the right questions that you really get the value and the insights that you need. So I, I would agree. I think that, that data underpins everything. Um, and gives us a really good <coughs> target to move towards. There's a, again, I'm going to draw the parallel to the related sector of, of energy and renewable energy in particular. So those two million generators that are sitting on rooftops around Australia at the moment, the energy market operator doesn't yet have a register of where they are or what their capabilities are. We can see the signal, <laughs> you know, it hollows out the curve in the middle of the day and we can predict what it will do um, with the help of our friends in the Bureau of Meteorology. But we can't actually, we, we, we don't have a register of it, we don't have a clear understanding of it and we certainly can't yet influence in a power system engineering sense what it actually does. That will change all of the necessary regulatory reforms and technologies to change that are now underway. And I think there's a huge opportunity to, you know, we're doing that with two million already there. We can get the electric, get in front of the curve on electric vehicles. Yeah. Uh, and, and these are highly correlated disruptions that I think we're very well placed to, to manage. Yeah. Great. And I, I just have to add to that. So, so in transport, the, the, the question of the demand, the demand pattern, demand pattern over space and time is, is a similarly black hole. And, and yet, it, so it's very difficult to optimise the performance of the network or, or, or somebody's bus operations or anything if you actually don't know what you're trying to, what demand pattern you're trying to serve. And we don't yet, but that becomes a, a sort of a, an urgent need for us to find a way to get a view on or, or build a picture of the, the demand of you. Your, your, what, what are your regular uh, movement needs um, throughout the city and the country and wherever it is you, you go? And uh, unless we uh, can understand that at some high level, we're, 
well, we need to understand that first in order to, to build an, an optimal transport system for you. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you all for um, responding to my comments. Um, it's now time um, for yourselves in the audience to put forward your questions. Um, there are two roving mics in the audience, so if you could raise your hand and the microphone will find you. Um, if you could please, oh great, we've got someone at the front already. If you could please um, give us your name and the organisation you represent, um, and please try and do sort of brief questions so we can get around everybody. So thank you, gentlemen in the front. Good. Uh, thank you all for that presentation, most uh, interesting. Um, my name is Bill Bennett, uh, the Mayor of the City of Whitehorse, and I'm here to, uh, to learn what emerging technologies uh, in the transport sector might be applicable to, uh, to people, basically, um, uh, as the level of government closest to the people. Um, I'm keen to learn how transport technologies can assist with people in their daily lives. Uh, but I was interested to know what the, uh, what's happening as far as drone technology is concerned. We haven't heard about that, uh, but we're certainly aware that uh, uh, drones are used to, uh, to be able to move freight as well as people, uh, from Domino Pizzas uh, to uh, Uber Eats uh, to some developments in actually people moving. So I'm interested to get your input on to how you see drone technology as an emerging technology in the transport sector. Okay. All right, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's an emerging technology. <laughs> um, so, so drones uh, are being experimented with quite widely and you know, so uh, photographers use drones quite a lot. There's a lot of you know, uh, video footage on TV and YouTube that's clearly drone driven. So there's there's a sort of starting point. But your question was more to towards the transport and, and delivering and what it is what what could they deliver? So uh, as you know, no Domino's and Australia Post even has has um, experimented with the ability to deliver stuff, especially small packages. And uh, I think. In all cases, those experiments were successful, and whether it's economically success and possible to do that is another question. But technologically, it's it's certainly possible to deliver stuff by drone. But you know, this is a bit of a science study, and and you know, there's a thing called gravity, and it's very hard to escape. And and every time you try to lift something up, it, it takes quite a lot of energy. And so, so people talk about, you know, could we, could we, could we drone your way instead of you know, fighting with the traffic? You drone the people around, and and yes, you can. And in fact, there's a there's a company in you know, somewhere that's just actually developed an electric an electric flying people transporting drone. So so, if you've got electricity in the grid that you've got a bit of spare, bit to spare, um, <laughs> the, the the technology certainly exists to make that happen, but is it likely to be Economically competitive. I, I really, I, I really don't think we've found an anti-gravity device yet. So I think the energy cost of droning substantial uh, masses around the countryside is going to be um, really high, and therefore the, the 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 niche, the application niche, is going to be relatively constrained for a relatively long time. But look, for small packages, urgent deliveries, heart transplants. Uh, uh, life-saving drugs, uh, response to 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 uh, 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 crisis and crisis situations. Yeah, absolutely, it'll be it, it'll be here tomorrow if it's not here already. Cecilia, is is that uh, conversations about drones and the the potential risks and safety? Does is that featuring in your world at all? Look, it does, and and we do. Um, you know, use drones. I think in a crisis type situation to actually try and understand after an event what's going on in an area. So, do people need recovery or, etc. Um, I'm just, I'm just sort of thinking about the difference between land based and, and air based. And I think the challenge with drones is that they come into your space in a way that we're not used to them as humans. So, we're used to birds kind of flying around. We're not necessarily used to humming machines that can spy through your windows and and look at what you're doing. Um, we're used to that more with vehicles than we are with, with drones. So I think there's probably some human um, interface, human drone interface issues around them actually coming into our space in a way that we're not quite used to. 
um, let alone the challenges of working with airspace regulators around what can, can be anywhere. So I think um, they're happening, there are experiments going on, they do have useful applications, but I'm not, I'm not sort of seeing them happen really quickly right now in, in, a, in a mass way. Or maybe not quite ready for them. Not quite ready. Okay. Um, other questions from the floor? Okay, we've got a lady at the back there. Thank you. Lou Will from the Productivity Commission. Look, one step uh, involved in the um, in in all of these technologies is the public testing of them, and that there, there are extra risks involved to the public or to public safety, presumably while technologies are being tested and government makes a decision on our behalf about whether or not and which technologies are ready to be publicly to be tested in public domains just wondering about your opinions on how well placed government is to make those decisions on our behalf and about what sorts of technologies are ready to be tested on our road roads rail waterways skies okay great thank you I think it's a, it's a great question and, and of course my mind immediately goes to the next technology, the next sector in which this project will study, which is the health sector, where I think the, the fundamental point that you're raising is even sharper in terms of the trialling and deployment of health-based technologies. Um, how well placed is government to do it? You know, uh, I, I guess... Well, somebody has to do it, uh, and if it's not government, who would it be? How well placed are they? I think that ties back to the opening question, Jacinda, that you asked about the role of research and, and how iterative and adaptive this is. I mean, government's uh, capacity to make good decisions on this is a function, I think, of how good the research is on which they make it. Governments are, governments are not going to jump into this area randomly. They'll be very conscious of the risks. Um, and I, I think this goes back to these research questions of how do we make it uh, where governments feel confident that they can approve trials and demonstrations and ultimately deployment because they're well grounded in, uh, in high-quality, well-structured research. If I can just add, um, different countries have taken a different approach. The US has taken a self-certification approach where manufacturers effectively have to certify um, certain standards. In Europe, there's, there's a different approach where there's more of a um, safety assurance uh, question that, or sort of bar that has to be met. I think, um, I think for Australia, we've got examples such as ANCAP, the um, body that tests vehicles across a number of criteria, and that's funded by both government and industry. And it, it then becomes a, a standard for um, an, a mechanism for testing the claims of, of manufacturers. So it's not to say that manufacturers are trying to, to be evil, but they, it is worth having their claims tested. So we have a pretty strong view that there needs to be some measure, whether it's government who is able to do that or an independent body of some sort, that can actually test the claims, um, particularly as we're talking about people who don't necessarily get the choice to be involved in trials. And we saw that in the, U in the US, where someone pushed a bicycle across the road, whether they should or shouldn't have been there is, is arguable, but they didn't necessarily know that they were part of a test um, and, and they ended up losing their life. So I think that there's there's some um, strong requirements on us. And if we go back to that original thing of uh, trust, how, do, how well do people trust that the technology will do what it says it will do, then it's even more important to have a higher bar. Yeah. Yeah. Just to say, so governments, especially here in Australia, are, are, all of them are very attentive to their responsibility to keep the community safe. Um, that, that's, that's a very high priority for them. So they, and, and that obliges them, and they do take a fairly uh, conservative and, and uh, I'll say even risk-averse approach to what they'll let out into the public domain. Um, and it's around that, that judgment call as to what, what is an acceptable level of risk to which to expose the public uh, or, or 
if, if there's a prospective risk, how can, how can it be mitigated so that the, the chances of uh, public harm occurring are, are minimised? That is exactly where the, the discussion is at it right now and it's where the research is going on. It's why, it's why there's trials in every jurisdiction for um, uh, automated shuttle buses uh, because everybody needs to learn how, how reliably those vehicles behave. So, so, and that's a process that's been going on for now a couple of years. Uh, and I think, I hope, we're at the, at, the, at the junction of being able to move up to um, more capable vehicles uh, being introduced into, into public streets. So there is a, you know, for instance, uh, Fortescue and the city of Caratha and the Western Australian government recently announced uh, that they're going to, um, uh, this is my words, not theirs, but turn Caratha into a, 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 a city for automated vehicles. Now, perhaps I got that slightly wrong, but anyway, that's based on you know, two or is it three years of, of experience in Perth with the, Australia's first automated shuttle bus. So they've, they've been driving it up and down the foreshore on South Perth there, uh, with, with you know, 10,000 times with no incident, so they finally feel confident that they can launch into the next phase of, all right, so let's take a more, more advanced vehicle and, and start doing it in a, in a safe way. So to your question, uh, the, the governments here, I think, do have a role. They take it very seriously, uh, and it's, it's for us and the ecosystem around them to help generate the, the, the evidence and the strategies that will enable us to progress forward quickly or to, to, to move forward as quickly as we can without um, exposing the community to undue risk. Great answer. Thank you all. Um, we've got a question here at the back. Malcolm, Al Malcolm Allen, Partners in Performance. If there were three regulations that you would, or laws that you would change, add, remove to drive innovation in transport technology readiness, what would they be? <coughs> One each, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I particularly like the work that NTC is doing to to uh, um, change the road rules so that so that vehicles don't need to be driven by a human driver. So at the, at the moment, uh, or how uh, Marcus is it 700, 700 rules or something? We, uh, our initial uh, work found seven hundred rules that would need to change across the yeah. territory federal legislation. So, so it's more than just one, but, but as a concept, the, the, the permissioning of, for vehicles to be under the control of an automated system uh, is, is, an, is an essential next step in, in, the, in that space, at least. Um, if I'm given one, I won't take 700. <laughs> but um, I think the, the point that both Drew and Ian made earlier around data is, is probably one that's quite critical. So there are so many unsolved problems in that space from... Um, the ethics, the privacy, the use, how much we will or won't sort of share, all of those things, I think that needs to be really addressed and it's a new area for us. And I think it potentially goes to something that we said earlier around what could be unique in Australia that we might be able to contribute to the world or what might we be able to sort of contribute to the world in this space. Having some really deep thinking in that space is transferable to other jurisdictions. So I think that would be the one that I'd do. Uh, Rather than chancing my own arm of king for a day, I'll quote the report. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'm going to take two. Um, so Because I think Cecilia's already, and Ian have already spoken to the data point. STEM education is actually one of those things that is, you know, the cross-cutting, no regrets measures, uh, right up there with all of the, the dimensions of data. And while you might not think of it necessarily as a legislative regulatory, it's certainly a policy um, issue where there's, where there's certainly room to do a lot more. But the other, the other is that the very first recommendation in the report was about the take up of uh, low and zero emission vehicles. And, and while we can confidently, today, confidently foresee a tipping point in the economics of these vehicles versus the conventional vehicles today, it's still going to require um, some sort of regulatory intervention to support uh, the initial uptake you know, during that, that transition period um, before these technologies win in the marketplace on their own right. 
So support around that uptake of low and zero emission vehicles would be the, the one that I'd highlight from the report. And I wish I could come up with something different, but I agree with yourself on the um, low and zero emissions and also the data piece as well. I think that's critical for or anything to move forward in this space. Okay, we have a question here. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Javier uh, Leal from Yara Trams. I haven't had the chance to read uh, the report, obviously, um, but I would like to ask, uh, have you considered um, the need to explore innovative business models as well as pushing for technology readiness? The reason why I ask this is because you highlight ITS as a solution, part of a solution. ITS is, a, a, as you know, a paradigmatic field in which there's been a lot of shortfalls with uh, duplicity investments, uh, a lot of projects failing, uh, not necessarily because of lack of technology readiness or lack of standardization, it's because of mainly lack of uh, accurate business models connecting with the, with the needs. So I wanted to, to dig a bit more on, on, on this. Thank so, you. Jacinta, can I, can I make one comment? Because then I'm, I'm sure that, that Ian and Cecilia can, could dive deeper. So a question about business models. Yes, the report talks about that many of these technologies will require different business models to, to be effect, for effective deployment. And mobility as a service is a very broad concept but it actually relates to many of these technologies. And I'm sure Ian and Cecilia have studied that further. Look, a quick, a quick comment would simply be that, um, you know, the whole point of innovation around, around this stuff is to drive new business models, new opportunities. So I think um, the benefit of having things like cooperative research centre initiatives, which drive towards that outcome is really critical. Um, and it's something I know, Drew, you're involved in um, uh, years ago in, in helping to set this up. So um, those sorts of mechanisms enable or foster that. And then I think it's incumbent on um, industry and other parties to really be actively looking beyond where they are today and looking at what's next. So if we have a think about mobility as a service, we have a trial underway um, with one of our um, university partners, the Institute for Transport and Logistics Studies. Um, and that's something that will help us to look at what do consumers actually want? What are some of the, you know, we sort of have the concepts around these things, but what does it actually mean when you start to look at it on a, on a daily basis? But um, yeah, I think it's a good point and it's really something that has to be an outcome that we drive towards as part of the research. Yeah, so just to add to that, we, we often sort of talk about emerging technologies and we you know, we, we talk about it as a wave or it's something that's going to happen or, or it's something the government's going to take care of or I'm not sure quite what. But the reality is that actually each of these technology adoptions is, is, is a sequence of steps, usually taken actually by companies, um, sometimes by government, but, but more often than not it's by companies, even if it's companies selling to government perhaps. And, and so it's not a wave, it's actually a series of... of uh, 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 spot opportunities that companies identify that, well, heck, we could take a bit of this and take a bit of that and we can make a new thing, a new product, a new service, and we could go and do that. So they, so they do and we encourage them uh, through iMove to, to have a go, to try out this sort of combination to see, so what does the business model look like? You know, can we make money out of it? Can, or can it at least cover it its costs? And, and we do that in a, in a sort of protected environment first so that we, we can then discard the failures and, and just pick on the ones that, oh, ah, heck, there's finally there's a way to run public transport without requiring a subsidy. Goodness me, that would be, that would be magic. Now, I'm not sure if we'll get there, but, but to, to your point, it, so finding the business model is absolutely essential, but we shouldn't anticipate that somehow there's going to be just one business model for automated vehicles. Uh, it, it, for sure it will be application by application uh, and and people will find first of all they'll find the, the easiest ways to do it and then they'll find the most valuable ways to do it uh, and that's how it will get introduced and it may never get introduced everywhere it, it will always be driven by economic return in effect and i believe that's where there needs to be a really strong dialogue between the organisations that are coming up with these new innovative business models and pushing and pushing, and government being receptive to those as well. Um, I think we have our last question here on the left. Thanks, Warren Harrison from GFC. It's a question to Drew. 
Uh, as somebody who spends their working life planning, designing and building transport infrastructure, uh, it's pretty sobering to see those figures from the report in terms of where we are with regard to infrastructure. There wasn't an awful lot of black in those circles, I seem to recall. So I'd be interested uh, to hear from you, where do you think we get our best bang for our buck going forward in the uh, area of transport infrastructure? Yeah, I, I'm going to... It'd be good if, if Ian could chip in on this as well. Look, my... I, I'm going to... In answer, responding to your point, I'm going to go back to a remark I made in the presentation that I look at the white space on that chart as opportunity rather than uh, disappointment or, or failure. Um, yes, infrastructure uh, and skills were the areas where we had the, the biggest gaps. I think part of the answer to your question, though, is is in that earlier discussion around data um, uh, as as one of the the fundamental areas that will enable the building of infrastructure. Um, certainly, I'm very conscious, as someone that that spends a lot of time in the energy sector, that that charging infrastructure is is a question mark. But as we've already discussed, I also think it's the one that we know least about. Um, so, but, but Ian, yeah, you... so it, it, it's an interesting question and I, I think it, we, we need to reflect a little bit on some of the process that went on in the, in the uh, research behind the report in the sense that uh, uh, we observed that if, if the problem's been already been solved, then we no longer perceive a, a, an infrastructure gap. So we know how to run managed motorways, for instance. and no, So there's no gap in mo managed motorways. but. But uh, you know, how are we going with, with um, uh, sort of coordinated intersection control? How are we going with uh, 5G? How are we going with uh, um, uh, anticipating demand? How are we going with uh, 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 electrical charging infrastructure for, for masses of... So, so the, 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 the white space and the circle is, is absolutely focused on the the opportunity in front of us as we that, that will need to, need to be filled as we uh, adopt and and uh, to support these these emerging technology it, it's not a sort of a, a scorecard on no what's it, what's the level of Australia's infrastructure and, and not at all we've actually got um, fairly good infrastructure it's just that to support these emerging technologies there's actually quite a lot more that needs to be done to improve system reliability, functionality, data intensity, the works. And I think the, the report highlights that, that work that's needed. There's so much investment in infrastructure um, across Australia at the moment. Thinking about that investment um, with consideration to these technologies is, is really important going forward. Um, so on that note, um, I'd like you to join me in thanking Ian Christensen from, from iMove CRC, Cecilia Warren from IAG, and Drew Clark, of course. Thank you. Thank you.